Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs> My name is Russell Gray. I am a guitar product specialist with Boss and Rolling Canada. And uh, we've got, we're going to have a really fun afternoon. We've got a really super cool new product to talk to you about, especially if you are a tube amp owner. Um, but first of all, I'd like to thank Long McQuaid for inviting us out here today to chat about the product. It's uh, Actually, it's more than a product, it's a lifestyle. Tube amps, I've loved them since I was a kid, and there's finally some cool stuff on the market to tame them. But yeah, thank you to Long and McQuaid for inviting us, and especially my buddy Matt Durante here, who's smiling behind the, uh, behind the glass. He's making everything look and sound good and keeping me on track. Um, so yeah, I'd like to keep this very interactive. So if you have any questions, jump in anytime. Uh, I will get to them. I've got a really cool question board here that I can see them. And we also have, uh, from across the country, our boss, speci our boss product specialists are on hand to jump in. If I can't get to a question quickly, they'll jump in and help me out, which is awesome. Hey, guys and girls. Um, so, yeah, we'll keep it interactive. And... Uh, and if there's anything that pops up on the screen, I might die, I might die you know, dive out of a particular thing into another if there's a question that's um, relevant on the screen. But other than that, I'll go through everything. So a um, little about me. Uh, I've been a musician in the Toronto area for most of my life, uh, playing in clubs around Toronto. I've been fortunate to play with some, some artists, and we get to play elsewhere, which is really, really awesome. So I do a little bit of traveling. But I've been a massive tube amp fan for my entire life. I have a, quite a passion for it and quite an amp collection. Um, there's some really cool ones. There's a nice trainer behind me, which is pretty awesome. Um, and, you know, in recent years, um, modeling has really, really come to the forefront. Uh, there's some amazing products on the guitar modeling side of things that will allow you to record directly, um, use, the, use the processor as an, a recording interface. Um, there's a ton of cool stuff. It just embosses lineup. You have the Katana amps. Uh, that you can use direct. There's uh, the whole GT series of processors from the GT1 to the GT1000. All of those can be recording interfaces, so that, that's, that's overlooked, um, um, but really cool to remember. And also behind me, my left, your right maybe, uh, is the brand new SY1000 guitar synths, which packs all of the awesome amp modeling from the GT1000 into the synths and all the cool synth engines, there's three of them, and it's a really, really cool product. And that is also a USB interface. So, yeah, so for, for modeling, uh, modeling guitar players have had it great for a while now. There's a ton of cool, feature, cool products to, to assist you in getting amazing guitar tones at home. But tube amps, it's always a trickier thing. Um, there's nothing like standing in front of a crank tube amp on the stage. If you've never done it, I definitely recommend it. Go to a Long McQuaid store and turn them up really loud. Matt said it's okay. And, and crank it. it they're amazing. Um, it, it's, a different, uh, it's a different set of rules altogether. And usually what happens, especially with my experience over the years, you can get a product that will sound great, not necessarily feel great, and vice versa. So um, the tube amp expander from Boss is really... Everything in one box I could ever imagine if you're a tube amp fan. Um, there's nothing quite like it. So, overview. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about today is how to tame, if you have a, you know, a non-master volume uh, old tube amp that's super loud and unusable in most locations, we'll, we'll go through how you make that usable in every location. Um, if you already have a great channel switching amp, uh, maybe you have control over your channels already, and you may think to yourself, hmm, I don't really see myself using um, a tube amp expander or a reactive load box. Um, I'll show you how the, how the tube amp expander can be a huge part, actually the whole hub of your rig. It's uh, a fantastic device. Uh, it, can, it, it solves a lot of issues with channel switching amps, uh, EQ issues, volume issues, um, you know, uh, level disparities between your clean and dirty channels. There's, there's some really cool things you can do with the Waza tube amp expander that solves a lot of problems. Um, so yeah, how to capture consistently great tones live or in the studio, especially either one of those two. Um, we know how sounds change from location to location. You put the mic slightly, somewhere slightly different off your cabinet and it's a totally different sound. So 
Uh, this is a way of keeping your sound consistent from night to night, venue to venue. Um, and I should mention th that it's a Waza Craft tube amp expander. People might be thinking, hey, what is Waza Craft? I'm not sure. Um, it means art and technique. And it's, uh, I know I have some friends that have bought the tube amp expander and they just call it the Waza. I'm bringing the Waza over to your place. There are actually a lot of other products in the Waza tube amp, uh, sorry, the Waza Craft lineup, um, not just the tube amp expander. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a concept that melds all the all the coolest stuff like um, high end components. Uh, if you t if you lift the uh, tube amp expander, it's 15 pounds. You can tell right away it's a solidly built unit. It'll work great live or at home. Um, and the Waza Craft title just embodies um, craftsmanship, and it's the pinnacle of design and innovation from Boss. It's really that simple. So it's a fantastically built unit um, that has spared no expense. So um, yeah, I'm going to chat about it a lot today and, and, and get some questions going, but we should see how it sounds right off the bat. So I'm going to play a little something here, uh, a little cool side note about this. I'm running this uh, through Pro Tools and uh, I'm getting MIDI commands are changing the, t the channels, the rigs. There's 10 rigs on the tube amp expander, so MIDI is going to be sending all those uh, program changes to change channels, which is cool. I don't have to do anything. So here we go. I'll see you and uh, be back in a couple of minutes. Cool. Are we back, Matt? The audio's good. Oh, there we go. So uh, that's what it sounds like. So in a nutshell, what's going on there, uh, separate from Pro Tools sending a whole bunch of program changes uh, to change the channels, is uh, you know a dirty, ch dirty channel with a bit of stereo delay on it into my uh, clean sound, which has a, a stereo dotted eighth with a bit of modulation on the repeats uh, of the delays, which sound really nice and wide. Um, yeah, into uh, a dirty channel with dotted eights going on too. So uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. So yeah, all of those sounds, all of those tones are built into the Waza Tube Amp Expander. So not just a load box, but all of those effects, so delays, reverbs, compression, EQs, are all in there as well. So you start seeing that it's a quite the the, uh, the hub of your rig. So. Um, so how did all this begin? Um, what I love to chat about is um, you know, the history of attenuation and getting your, your 100 watt uh, amps under control. I'm going to do a little, uh, little minimizing here. Um, let's get rid of Pro Tools here for a second. There we go. We won't go to that yet, Matt. But um, yeah, so where did all this begin? How did this start? Um, 
So, you know, back in the 60s, you know, you had really raging tube amps, no real PA system. So your amp had to be loud to cut through, get, you know, through the noise of the band and, and just to be heard. But, you know, as time moves on, that became an issue. Uh, the amps are too loud. We're playing in smaller spaces now. Um, I, I, I have my amazing 412 cabinet here that actually I bought it along McQuaid in 1986. But honestly, I take that out to shows maybe once or twice a year. It's just not practical anymore and certainly not uh, in the club level. So volume has become an issue, especially with tube amps. And, you know, going back right to the beginning. And one of my favorite guitar players, Eddie Van Halen, um, it was well, the first one that I, I knew that was, was starting to get into these types of um, products. Uh, you know, he played a 100 watt Marshall, all the knobs on 10. It sounds incredible, but you can imagine how, how loud that would be. So on, on my, on my uh, computer screen here, if Matt can share that, um, it's one of my favorite images of the early days of um, attenuating. Basically what it, what's going on here is Eddie, you, I always say he looks really cool in the Hawaiian shirt. I have Hawaiian shirts, but I do not look that cool in the Hawaiian shirt. But Eddie does. Um, the cool thing that I really like about this picture, this is from probably 85, 86, in that ballpark somewhere, uh, on a David Letterman show. Uh, he was uh, he subbed in with the band that night. And what's, what I think is really cool, in the background you can see Eddie's Marshall. Um, on the la bottom left corner of Eddie's Marshall is usually where the jewel light would be. Um, you can see it on my amps when we change screens later, but you, you'd see the red LED, it's always there. You, you don't, they're there, woohoo. So you don't notice that on Eddie's amp, and the reason why is because he's using a Variac and the voltage is turned way down. So I know on my Marshalls to get, to get the voltage down s to a point where there's no red LED, you're probably around 80 volts somewhere in there, depending on the incoming voltage. But um, So what he was doing was turning down like a dimmer switch, turning down the voltage coming out of the wall going into his amplifier to make his amp quieter. It's a pretty crude way of doing things and I will say as um, a boss specialist that we do not recommend this for most tube amps or really any tube amp. They can really damage your amp and it's an... We've come a long way. There's no need to do that anymore. But I do have one right behind me here. I'll grab it. So excuse my reach. They're super heavy and clunky, but this is basically a Variac. That's... Um, what Eddie would have used, something very similar to this. Um, big knob on the top that uh, controls the voltage going to your amp and drops the volume and uh, not in the most desirable way, I'll, 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 I'll admit, but it, you know, it gets the job done, but you could really damage your amplifier with one of these things and on most amps, they sound terrible. Like It's just, you know, back in the 70s, you had to do what you had to do. So th th this was basically, you know, the best they could do. So. Um, so that's where it came from, uh, the original tuning down of things. Um, of course, another great artist, Alan Holdsworth, also had a product um, as well called a juice extractor, and I still have my juice extractor, and that was a similar kind of thing, trying to knock the volume down differently, and it had some EQ on it, but still not quite, um, not, not a great result. So you can see going way back, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, we've been wrestling with to, with volumes, um, especially tube amp volumes. So the heart uh, of the Waza tube amp expander and going right to the front of this, if you can switch to the front mat, um, it's pretty, pretty cool stuff going on here and industry leading and there's nothing really else on the market that I know of that does this. Uh, I'll start on the far left side of the Waza tube amp expander. This is the heart of the tube amp expander. It is the reactive load and um, not only is it a reactive load, uh, it's a variable reactive load with, with, within these two, the resonance Z and present Z and Z for our American friends. But um, that's how you tune the impedance curve or the load that your amp is seeing. Um, so that, that, that can get a little bit complicated and, and, and it's really interesting why you would need that. But this is the heart of the, the tube amp expander right here. There's 16 different combinations. Now, the reason why you do that is I'm playing a Marshall, modded Marshall type of amp, and it's, um, you know, usually you'd pair that with a greenback, maybe you'd pair it with a Vintage 30. Um, and my Marshall cab here is G1275. So um, th that's a, the type of speaker that your amp would feel at, 
that type of amp would feel most at home playing. And, and when you play through your amp, when it's loaded with an impedance curve with one of those speakers, it sounds and feels exactly like your amp. Well, that, that's really cool, but if you have you know, a Vox AC30 or what if a, uh, a Fender, uh, like uh, any type of, you know, an old twin or basement or deluxe reverb, I mean, super, comp, uh, super reverb, you know, they're, they're really loud amps. Even some of them are only rated at 20 watts, but 22 watts, but they're super loud. So if you were using an amp like that, you, you may not necessarily want to go into a greenback uh, impedance curve. So this part of the, the Waza Tube Amp Expander is where you would tune that to your amplifier to get the best results. And it's amazing how, how much difference it makes, and it, and it really does work. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the things that um, I've learned over the years with, with Tube Amp Expander, one of the first things I try with attenuators, load boxes, um, and the like, is trying it with my clean sound, because Typically on a clean sound with an amp that's loaded down in a, in a fashion, whether it's a load box or it's an attenuator, the clean sound usually has artifacts around it, like little distortion artifacts. Not quite distortion, but you'll strum a chord, and it's not quite as clean as your amp sounds in the room. There's a little bit going on there. So that's the first thing I tried when I got the Waza Tube Amp Expander, like simply hitting a clean chord. So it, it's super clean. Now the clean channel on my amp is super clean, so I w I'm not expecting to hear any weird artifacts, and there are none. It's, it, it keeps the amp crystal clear. So for me, right off the bat, I know there's, uh, it's reproducing the sound of my amp perfectly. Uh, it's not adding any of those artifacts. And I believe it's because of the tuned variable reactive load on the, on the Waza Tube Amp Expander, which allows that. It, it's, um, I mean, it doesn't seem like much, but that's pretty incredible. I mean. Uh, to get your clean actually clean is is awesome. So that's that that's on this side over here. R right beneath those two knobs is your uh, volume control going to your amp uh, to your speaker cabinet. You don't need to run a speaker cabinet, but um, if you are, this is where you'd adjust its volume right under here in speaker control. And it's a um, it's not a stepped control. It, it it's a it, it's raging full all the way down to whisper quiet. And there's no, no stepping in between, so you can you can always find the perfect volume um, for your amp. And it's and we'll talk a little bit about it later. But it's it, it's using a, a Class AB 100 watt power amp. So again, another feature that is packed into the Waza Tube Amp Expander. So that's really the heart of the Tube Amp Expander right there. An amazing sounding variable reactive load. Uh, we move into the middle section here. Uh, the, the rig now. You have ten different rigs that can be switched via a GAFC foot switcher. Um, maybe you're gonna switch with MIDI, so ES5, ES8. Uh, I sh Pro Tools earlier was switching between those rigs, but you have 10 rigs and it's pretty powerful how you use those. You could just simply have you know, different cabinets. You decide, um, well, I'm gonna record direct today and I just want, I'll, I'll set up my 10 rigs with 10 different cabinets and mic positions and an easy way to scroll through them on a session. That's one way of doing it. You could, you could set them up as amp channels, basically, like rig one is my clean channel, rig two is my dirty channel, or how I have it set up, rig two is my um, clean channel with a bit of reverb on it, a bit of delay, and again, the delays are coming from the Waza Tube Amp Expander. So I'll give you a little bit of a uh, sense of how that would sound. <laughs> Now the one thing it can't do is edit out poorly played guitar and mistakes. I wish it could, but anyway, but you get the idea. That that's super clean, bit of delay, bit of reverb all coming from the Waza Tube Amp Expander. So that's one of the ways of using the rigs. Um, and I think it's quite powerful, especially if you're on a gig and you, you have multiple settings or multiple channels that you want to use. Um, it's, it's doable. And 
we'll dive into the cabinet choices, microphone choices, moving ca microphones around and all that uh, shortly. But that's where all of that magic happens on the rig knob. Uh, right next to that is a reverb control. Um, as I mentioned, there's a f full reverb in the Waza tube amp expander. And I'll explain later how you can send, you can send reverb to your amplifier on stage if you want, or to direct to front of house. You, to both or to neither or to one or the other, it's all, uh, so that, that's really cool. Maybe you want some reverb on your stage cabinet but not going to front of house, that's all doable within the editor that we'll get to um, a little bit later on. So that's the reverb, that's where you t turn up the level of your reverb control. Over here is the input peak signal. So this is a very important part of the tube amp expander. Um, you want that being green, it's about your dirty channel. You want that showing up as a green light as opposed to yellow or, or red. Um, if it is going red, it, it's overloading the input. So on the back, we'll talk about that in a minute, you can switch the wattage uh, rating to up to 100 watts. I have it set on 50 watts right now. Um, so that's uh, input light. that You've got a line out. We're using those right now. That's the feed you're hearing out in Facebook land. You're hearing my stereo line outs. And then, of course, the phones, which is going to our little monitors in here, so or could be your headphones. The four switches in the middle of the amp, which I skipped over purposely, from left to right, effects loop, so you, can, you have full control on turning on the onboard series or parallel effects loop. So it, it's either series or parallel, and ground lifts on the send and return, which is a massive help for live. Um, I'm a huge fan of ground lifts. I never thought I'd say that, you know, especially across the country on a live Facebook stream. But the Waza 2 Bamp Expander is packed full of ground lifts. So any noise issues are a thing of the past, especially if you're interfacing with computers, USB, uh, any kind of things that get thrown at you on a gig, that's huge. Um, the effects, turning those on and off, pretty self-explanatory. That turns on your delay and your reverb and uh, compression if you're using it. Uh, solo slash EQ is pretty cool. There's, there's actually three onboard EQs. The two main ones, you have one going to your cabinet, one going to the front of the house. That's where you turn both of those on if you want, or certain, maybe you want one going to your cabinet, one going to the front of the house. So it, with each rig, it saves within a preset, so you can decide what you want to do with your EQs there. There is a master EQ as well, uh, which is just an overall EQ of, the, of your entire rig, um, which is quite handy as well. L uh, last button on here is the amp control button, which is how you'd use that to switch channels of your, your amplifier. So uh, if you have a, let's say you have a, a, a cable, quarter inch cable going from your foot switch to your amplifier to change channels, um, just plug out of your amplifier foot switch out into the amp control in on the back of the tube amp. Uh, expander and you can switch the channels on your amp from the front panel or your GAFC or MIDI switch or whatever you're doing you can uh, channel switch with with this so that's the front panel we will click over to the back really quickly I've got a, a slide up there which will help save me from lifting this thing um, it's pretty heavy um, so you can see right off the bat there's a lot going on there but it's really really laid, really well laid out um, and this, these features are not found really in any other product all in one place. It's a testament to the Wazacraft um, credo, and that's just basically pack as much cool stuff as you can in. <laughs> Give the maximum about, amount of value. So now, and that's what's happening on the back here. So you see in the middle, top middle there, there's a red section, and that's where you would plug your tube amplifier in. So you come out of your, your amp into that input, uh, to the left of it is an impedance switcher, so 4, 8, and 16, so you, you don't have to buy a separate, it's not a fixed impedance, so you 4, 8, and 16. If you have a 2 ohm amp, uh, just use the 4 amp um, setting. Uh, to the right of the input is an input level uh, switch that takes you from 5 watts, 50 watts, to 100 watts. Um, the tube amp expander is rated for 150 watts. Um, if you do have a, like, let's say a diesel or a super loud amp, uh, I think some of the PV EVA chance might have went to 120. Um, uh, if you do have an amp that's that loud, yeah, put it to the 100 watt setting and just 
you know, maybe don't crank the whole thing all the way up and pay close attention to the input signal on the front. It will let you know if uh, the input is too hot. But that's where you would make that adjustment. Um, it's also uh, where you would connect. Let's say you have a little uh, orange tiny terror or something, or a, what the one watt Marshall, uh, and you want to turn that into a hundred watt behemoth. This is where you would connect it into the back of the Waza tube amp expander. Let, leave it on ten watts. And with the volume control on the front of the tube amp expander, you, n you now have access to a 100 watt class AB power amp that can turn you know, literally a one watt amp into a raging monster. It's, it's pretty cool. So you don't necessarily need to go with you know, these big 100 watt, 50 watt amps. So some of the best sounding amps are smaller amps. Um, you know, Neil Young, uh, uh, there's a ton of bands, Neil Young, uh, Nazareth, I don't know, small, tiny little lamps in the studio cranked, Nazareth. You haven't heard that name in a long time. Th th there's probably people watching, I don't even know who Nazareth are, but I grew up in Scotland and there's a Scottish connection to Nazareth, so it's maybe that's why I thought about them. But, um, so that's, a, that's the, the hub of the back of the tube amp expander, that red section right there. To the left of that, you have two speak parallel speaker outs, A and B. Um, to the right, you have a headphone jack, and this is where it gets really cool. The line outs and F, something called an FOH, mono in brackets, FOH line output. Um, so what is that? that that's, usually that's the, the output I use 90% of the time on a gig. I don't usually run in stereo. So, um, and I think most that's the case for most people in most situations. But um, it's a mono output direct to the front of house mixing console. And, and what's cool about that is any level changes that you make on the front of the tube amp expander do not get reflected on that front of house output. Um, so you can change anything you like on the front. That volume is fixed and the sound person will thank you for that. So because you won't be affecting their volumes at the console. So that, that's a really cool output. I really like that. The volume is adjustable with inside the editor and I'll show you how to do that a little later on. So you do have full control over how loud that front of house volume is. Uh, it's not readily apparent on the unit itself, but when you connect to the editor, you, you can see exactly where to do that uh, to send the optimal signal to front of house. And again, ground, ground lift switch on the FOH uh, line out. Beside that is your stereo left and right line outs. Pretty self-explanatory. That's what's going over the mat in our mixer today. And um, also, uh, ground lift on those as well. Uh, ground lifts are hugely important and uh, usually omitted. Uh, so that's you know a huge welcome having them on the back there. It's, it saves our bacon in, in a lot of um, instances. So below there, below the line outs, you've got the effects loop, send and return. Uh, there's a loop series parallel switch there that you can switch if you're running your effects in series. Most people are and uh, level switch plus four minus ten so you can incorporate your rack effects there that typically are at line level they're plus four most pedals are um, minus ten so and I have a pedal incorporated into the loop I have my trusty OD 200 here which I'll, I'll get to a little later on with a little cool trick that you can do with the Waza tube amp expander if uh, you know if things go if things aren't going well on your gig and I'll explain that but yeah so that, that, that's all patched into the effects loop and really important on the effects loop, ground lifts, I know I keep saying ground lifts, um, ground lifts on the send and the return. How cool is that? So um, as we know, uh, a lot of you have amplifiers with effects loops. There's no real standard for effects loops, so sometimes it can be noisy. Um, there's a question coming in there, I'm taking a look. Oh, cut that, okay. Uh, so effects loops can be super loud, <laughs> um, and there's no real standard on them as far as level and all that kind of stuff. So having ground lifts on both the send and the return can be a lifesaver on a show. In a situation like this, we have you know studio lighting, broadcast lighting, computers everywhere, running USB audio with mod everything's plugged into the same thing. So if there's ever a chance for a ground loop, loop, it would be right now, and we've got a really clean signal going out to you. And uh, I think I just have one of the ground lifts uh, lifted. So uh, amazing that they're in there. Uh, beside that is the USB, which is pretty self-explanatory, but um, that's where you would connect to your computer, download any updates, 
connect to the editor, which is vital, and also how we're using it today to, uh, as, an, as an audio interface to, to uh, get audio in and out of Pro Tools. Because um, it was a two-band expander is a, a, an interface as well. Um, moving along, MIDI in, out, and through. So again, yeah, switching uh, via MIDI is all done through there. Uh, foot control section, which is the GAFC. Um, I have my GAFC connected there right now. And there's also uh, an effects loop jack as well. So if you, need, uh, if you have like an FS5 switch or an FS7, you can switch the loop on and off there if uh, you were doing it via a uh, you know, foot pedal of some kind. And then very, at the very end there, our amp control setting on the bottom left which is, um, that's, I mentioned it earlier, you connect that jack to your channel switching jack of your amp, and that's how you control the channels on your amp. So it's a pretty feature-rich um, product. I, I, I can't think of anything that hasn't been uh, addressed and you know, built really well and sounds fantastic. So again, going back to the reactive load for just for a second um, on the front here. There's 16 options. Right on top of the unit, which you can't see, there's a handy guide that helps you adjust or, or, or suggest what those settings would be for your particular amplifier. So for my, my Marshall, I've got it on low, mid, and high. Which, uh, But what's really cool is you can play with these uh, and go outside of uh, what, what would be expected for your amp. You can, you can dial in different sounds uh, that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So I'm not sure if it's just going to translate through camera here, but I will... Um, that's the setting I have right now. I'm going to drop the resonance all the way down to low. Just for fun, I'm not sure how this is going to sound, but uh, let's put them both on low. And I don't know if you can hear that, but when you turn these knobs, it's a distinctive relay click that you hear it going through all the different impedance curves. It's really cool. We are low and low, which really should not match my Marshall at all, but this is what it would sound like. So I know you can't tell this on Facebook, but it, it feels really cool, um, really spongy. I think it's like a champ setting or something, like a completely different than what you'd normally set it for. So I'll go back to my regular settings, but it's amazing that you can do that. And as a studio tool, that's pretty fantastic. If you want to make you know, a slight adjustment to the way your amp is sounding, maybe you dip out some of the bottom with a different impeding curve. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, so features here. Um, Mentioned the Class A 100 watt power amp. So the way that this works is you, the amp gets loaded down as a reactive load box with those settings I just showed you, and then reamped as a 100 watt Class AB power amp. And you have full control over that on the front, going to your cabinet. And the power amp is super clean, super super. Um, yeah, you want something that's that doesn't color your tone at all. Because remember you. You're loading the entire amp down, so preamp and power amp all at the same time. So when you reamplify all of that, you want a super clean linear power amp, and that's what what's built into the Waza Tube amp expander, uh, and it's 100 watts, so it's super loud. Again, like if you had a small one watt amp, you could really keep up with the band, and that is is pretty cool. Um, now, which leads me to what, what I mentioned earlier with channel switching amps. You might be thinking, well, I got an amp, I got an amp at home. It's a couple channels on it, sounds killer, I can turn the volume down. I've always found that even with control over your tube amps, they always sound just a little bit better at that uncomfortable level. Like, you know, not a gig level, but, you know, too loud for the house probably, and definitely too loud for a condo where I live. So it's still not 
you know, still not ideal. So your amp usually at home is lower than where you'd prefer to have it. Or if you have an old school amp, I have a few of these where the volume controls are so touchy on them, like, like less than one is nothing and just one is, is way too loud. So th those amps, you know, just don't get played uh, the, very rarely, but now I can. So, th so there's a bunch of different ways of using your tube amp expander. And as far as channel switching amps, one of the things I think is really interesting is, um, you know, I found this out the hard way playing gigs, is that I, I would dial in my amp on stage, got a great clean sound, great dirty sound. And to me, it sound balanced on stage. I've got my cleans loud, my uh, distortion's a little bit louder, and, but, they're, but they're balanced. Um, but then the, the sound person's saying, you know, your clean channel on, it is quieter than your dirty channel, but on the board, when you look at the level going into the board, it's spiking and clipping the input of the board. And that's because the clean channel is so uncompressed and compared to your dirty channel, it's a wide open, uncompressed signal. So even though it's lower in volume, it's louder and transient, so it clips the input uh, of, a, of a sound mixing board. And something I never even realized, you know, because it doesn't, you don't hear that on stage, that's just something that, you know, the sound mixer has to deal with. And usually how they deal with it is they just slap a compressor across everything. So when you do switch to your dirty channel, um, on stage it sounds great to you, out front there's a compressor on that you'd probably rather not have because your dirty channel compresses by itself naturally. So that was an issue that was brought to my attention. And the cool thing with the Waza Tube Amp Expander is that rig one on all of my rigs is clean with no effects, but I do have a compressor in the, uh, in the front end, and I'll show you how to set this up in the editor. But I turn a compressor on on my clean channels so that I can level out the, the peaks of the transients that are going to the front of house and keep that level where the engineer wants to see it. I switch to my dirty channel, which will be a different rig without the compressor, and they naturally balance, and, and it saves them popping a compressor across both channels when you, when you don't really want it. So I think that's, that's a pretty cool feature, even if you do have a great sounding uh, channel switching amp, there's always solutions built in. And someone might be out there going, well, you could just put a compressor in the front end of your amp. True, but um, what I love about doing it after your amp, it's like, they're like studio quality effects, and you retain all the dynamics of your guitar plug directly into the front end of your amp. Um, you know, that relationship between your guitar, preamp stage, power amp stage with, you know, the output transformers, um, all doing their thing without any kind of inter anything coloring that. So what I love about it is, yeah, you get to keep all the character of your amp, all the dynamics of your amp, and you're gonna compress it afterwards. So much like you would in a studio um, situation. So I think that's a really huge plus for the tube amp expander, even if you're not using an amp that, that uh, you know, is a non-master volume 100 watt Marshall. You'll necessarily need to. The other cool thing that you can do, if you do have a great a switching amp, um, once, you, once you've got your amp connected to the tube amp expander, you don't necessarily have to, to play at uh, insanely loud volumes because um, it doesn't really matter anymore. So the, what I mean by that is you just dial in your channels with your sw channel switching amp to sound best in the room and not really worry about oh, is this going to be loud enough when the drummer starts? It doesn't matter anymore. So you get your clean sound to sound clean, you know, even with humbuckers, maybe the volume's not as loud as it usually would be on a gig. You get that sounding nice, match your lead channel to that, switch back and forth to make sure you have a good balance, and then you're probably thinking to yourself, well, I can just tell by the way that how loud the volumes are, as soon as the drummer kicks in, I'm not going to be loud enough. Like, it, it sounds great, but it's not loud enough. That's where the 100 watt power amp kicks in and you can make up that volume on the front end of the amp with, with a really clean sounding power amp. So it's, so it's the perfect solution really for um, channel switching amplifiers as a hub to your rig and, uh, and staying consistent every night. Once you've got all of that stuff set, it's, it's, um, it's the same all the time. Um, yeah, and then I mentioned rigs earlier, those 10 rigs, and that's how you would switch between different um, different settings and I'll play um, sorry Matt hates it when I talk and play the guitar at the same time mm -hmm. I, apparently if you're a professional presenter you don't you don't do that kind of thing um, 
or at least to give it a little bit of a warning. It didn't do that. But anyway, so this setting, um, again, it's on my clean channel, dotted eighth note rhythms. Um, I think there's a stereo delay on there. Uh, but it's a really good, um, it, sh it shows off the, the, the delays, the compression, and the reverb all in one nice rig. So let's see how this sounds. Cool. So yeah, sparkly clean um, because there's no artifacts from being loaded down. And, uh, and I believe that's a pan delay that's on the uh, Waza 2 Pan Expander. And we'll go through some of those settings. Um, here is a screenshot of the editor if you want to flick to that for a second, Matt. This is uh, what the editor looks like. Um, once you get it loaded down and loaded onto your computer, it's, uh, it's, it's very simple but very intuitive. Um, and everything you need is in there, and I'll, I'll, I'll pop into the actual editor in a second. But just at a quick glance, on the left, on the left side of the editor there is where all the rigs lived, all 10 of them, and you can rename them whatever you like. Um, and then the, the little diagram there follows the signal chain. So I'm going to pop out of this and into the editor. There it is. And uh, are we seeing all of that? I might change this a little. Oh, there we go. Is that better, Matt? Yep. There we go. There. So we're cutting off a little, just, uh, we're cutting off the screen a little bit here, but I, I will kind of slide it over and, and, and show you what we're missing. But so here on, uh, down the left column there is where all the rigs live. You can tell them on my dotted eight note setting there. Um, and this area right around here, this is your entire signal chain. And super simple and easy to follow along. So, you know, out of your amplifier comes into the, the editor here. First thing it hits is this effects loop. I have it turned on. If I wanted to click that off, it's a simple, you know, click that off. Um, it shows you your signal that will light up. So you see the signal light coming on on the input, and you'll also notice at the output back here to my speaker cabinet is up on the top row, and my direct, my line signal is on the bottom. You'll see the uh, green signal coming on there too. So there's a few spots where you're actually seeing signal uh, moving around your rig. So, you, so out of there into the compressor. Now what's really cool with the compressor, so I have it turned on on my clean channel. Again, if I want to turn it off, I can, there's a couple of spots but I can, where I can do that. I can do it right here or just by double clicking on the compressor icon. Um, so in the compressor uh, pedal itself, there's two options, this drop down box with two different types of compressors. I'm using one called a Vintage Rack U is what it's called. And it's a really cool compressor. It's a uh, you know, these vintage Yuri compressors, 1176 is almost every guitar player has heard of those, they're famous. This is based on an 1178, which is a stereo version of an 1176, so really cool. And of course on the top, the Rack 160D is, um, you know, 560D DBX type compression, really cool sounding compressor as well. I'm old, so I just chose the old one. I don't know, they both sound amazing, and um, I think they really, really 
really welcome addition to the front end of your chain. Now, when I say front end of the chain, this is after the amplifier. So we're already out of our amp, and now we're compressing. So I think that's really kind of a cool way uh, to compress on your clean channel. So next, next uh, area here is our delay. And I'm a massive fan of delays. You can tell I'm on the pan setting delay here. Um, a little drop-down box that shows you five different delay settings. Uh, but look at that. Sneaking in right at the bottom is an SDE3000, the actual algorithm from an SDE3000. If you know much about rack delays, they are pretty iconic. You know, U2, David Gilmore, Van Halen. Um, you know, almost everybody had one of those in their rack or wanted to. I couldn't afford one, so I have an SDE1000, which is killer still. But one day I will get the 3000 for sure. Uh, they're hard to find, but if you can find one, grab one. They're pretty awesome. Uh, but the algorithm is right in here. So yeah, grab a tube amp expander instead. Um, so that's where all the delays live. Uh, cool thing with pa the pan setting, um, the bottom down here is the pan t type. I've got to set it 99%. If I could make that 100% so it's exactly the same left and right, but even dropping it one percentage, just knocks off the stereo image just a tiny bit and makes the guitar sound wider. So I think that's a really, really neat, neat effect. If you wanted to match things like dotted eighth notes along with quarter notes, maybe drop that down to 66% or 50% 50, 50 to get different rhythmics, uh, rhythms against your uh, quarter note. But for this particular example, I love the 99% setting. I use it too much. Like it's definitely the 80s big guitar sound setting. Um, and that's, that's pretty awesome. So, so from the top row here, you have delay times, which I can tap on my GAFC, feedback, high cut, which is pretty important. Uh, I can turn the modulation on and off so I can decide whether or not I have chorus on the repeats or not, and I do, and it's fully uh, adjustable there. Uh, effect level and direct level. So everything you need to, uh, to make killer sounding delays. Um, single line, if you're just running in mono, that's a really cool, cool delay. Uh, stereo pans your uh, your dry guitar off to one side, effect off to the other. It's kind of a really neat effect to it uh, as well. Um, analog speaks for itself. It's an old analog type of uh, uh, delay. And of course, the SDE 3000. Uh, and our final chain before we split our signal is the reverb settings. And my, my screen is probably blocking a, a little bit of that. But, um, but uh, drop down box. Two halls, two rooms, a plate, and a spring. Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of partial to the plate. Uh, maybe it's my Van Halen, love for Van Halen and 80s metal. But uh, I just love a plate uh, reverb. And it sounds killer on the, on the tube amp expander. So this is where things get really, really cool. T top line here, you've got the usual stuff. Time, I can tone. I've got it down to minus eight because I'm playing a Strat. So take off some of the, the top end. I don't have it that dense. Pre-delay, which seem, I have it set for 125 milliseconds, which seems like a lot, but it, it um, if you're picking fast, it just allows a little extra second for the for the for the attack of your note to come through before the delay kicks, uh, before the reverb kicks in. So it helps to, to keep your sound cleaner, I find, with the longer pre-delay. But that's certainly um, that's certainly you know preference, player preference. Um, so over here, on uh, okay, before we get to the right section, down at the bottom here, low cuts, I can dampen the low end of the reverb and high cut. So you got control over the highs and the lows. This right hand section here is where things get pretty cool. Two separate sections for your speaker and line out. So this is where you would say um, or make that decision where I want reverb going to my, my cabinet on stage you would do it right here. So speaker output, send is on, effect levels at 100%, uh, and, and then the actual global level, which is what the uh, preset is saving, is around 91. So I got it up pretty high. Um, line output, this is where it's going to front of house. So you can turn the, both these on or off if you'd like. So you could have one going front of, you typically I don't send reverb to front of house, uh, just depending on the venue. Uh, it just, and I think a lot of times the front of house engineer wants to control that themselves. Sometimes they're fighting a really lively room anyway, and it's not going to help them much if I send them more reverb. So um, I usually don't send reverb to front of house, but I like it on my amp. So, um, you know, clean sound, I may have it uh, on the cabinet 
not going to going to front of house. So anyway, so that's a pretty cool thing right there with the with the reverbs. Now going back to the signal diagram here, uh, after the reverb, it splits into two two legs. So the top leg is where it goes out to your uh, speaker cabinet. So the first thing it hits is our speaker EQ, and it can either there's a paramedic EQ, parametric sorry that it's on right now, or I can switch to a graphic EQ. Sometimes that's a little easier for as guitar players to dial in, you know, slide some things around is so much easier than, you know, knowing what you're doing. Just kind of grab these things and move them around. Um, perfect. But if you do know what you're doing, um, or you want to get into some pretty cool EQing, there's low cuts and high cuts, which are, that's typically where I live. If, if the sound's a little too robust in the bottom end, I'll just do maybe a, a, a low cut, maybe around, you know, sometimes around 80, 80 hertz and around there. And high cut, you know, I think around 10K, like there's not much going on on guitar above that, but um, I might cut it around 10K, but that's typically what I would do here. Um, and that, the cool thing about this is I can, you can almost see it on the side here, it's almost cut off. Um, I'll just slide it, I'll just slide this thing a little bit to the right so you can see what's going on here. Panel button assigned, so I can decide whether or not this EQ is accessible from the front panel switch here. So if I have, right now it is. So when I hit that switch on and off, you can see both my, let Matt switch back to the editor here. You can see both my EQs coming on and off there. If I go in here and say, uh, disable, Now only my line level EQ will come on when I hit that button. Or let's say it's a foot switch making that change or a MIDI, MIDI command from a device. So basically I, I've got the option here of sending my EQ out to front of house or to my cabinet or both. Now it's also, this EQ can also be used as a solo boost as well, um, which is quite, quite handy. Um, so back to the bottom leg here, there's my uh, line EQ. Same thing, can be parametric or graphic. That's super handy. And uh, out of here we've got something called SIM, which is really where all the fun begins. And I'm going to switch, you know what I'm going to do? I, I will switch to a different guitar sound here. Where is my dirt sound? Here it is. Let's just make sure this is my dirt. <laughs> So that's my dirty guitar sound with a bit of delay on it. Um, this cab sim uh, area is pretty interesting. This is where all the, all, all the fun happens. So this first drop down box is cab type. And you can select, you can see all the cabinets here, there's a ton of them. There's about 23 cabs that come with the Wazza Tube Amp Expander ranging from F like Rectifier 412s, Marshall 412s, uh, all the way down to a one a 1x8 Champ, like an old vintage Champ. You've got Vox AC30s. Um, what else is in there? Uh, well, we can just go down the list. Uh, Super Combo, Tweed Combo. Um, so you've got a, a wide range of speakers you can choose from, whether it's Jensen's on the old Fenders or uh, Vintage 30 Greenback mixes on some of the modern 412 cabinets or uh, the Alnico CTS that's on, uh, I believe that's on the Tweed Deluxe, uh, which is really cool. So anyway, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through some of these and now with some of these cabinets are not optimized for the Marshall I'm using. So for example, if you ever wanted to hear what your Marshall sounded like through, let's say a, a, a one eighth amp, where is it here? A little mini combo, this is what it would sound like. <laughs> Really small sounding and pretty cool though. Like that would probably record really well, and especially if you double track that or triple track it. I bet it would sound incredible. Anyway, so that that's what you're you're doing when you're when you're going into this. So let's just say I pick. Uh, let's choose something here. I'll choose one of my favorites here. Is the four twelve four front of house. This one right here. Um, so I really love this cabinet. Basically, 12-inch uh, 
Celestia and I believe it's Greenbacks that are in this 412 to front of house. So I, I've picked my cabinet. Now, now I can pop over here and pick my microphones and there's a bunch of them here. So 57 is pretty classic, 427, 421 sorry is classic, um, 451, uh, it's like an AKG 451, amazing uh, uh, microphones, condensers, there's a ribbon mic there, a 121, we know what that one's after. There's three blends here, so that's a blend of a 57 and a 121, and it just starts with, you know, blend A is you know, roughly a 50-50 mix, blend B is, is slightly more on the, uh, the 57, and blend C is more on the, four, on, the, on the 121. And flat, interestingly enough, is what it would sound like with a reference microphone you know, measuring your cabinet in the room. So it's very similar to an in the room type of a sound. What we're hearing, and I should mention that, is what your amp would sound like mic'd through a cabinet. So it's not necessarily the sound you get in a room, but more of the sound that you get when you're sending it to the front of PA, to a studio for, for Pro Tools or for recording. Um, and that's what this, this is where you control the microphone you're using. So it's a huge difference. So here's the 57. <laughs> I'll go flat. So here there's a lot more bottom end on the flat signal compared to the 57. Um, here's the 57 again. Might be getting time to tune this guitar in a minute, but but you can you can hear the differences as I as I scroll through different microphones. I'm on blend B there. Um, I'll just tune this a little bit. Blend B is the mixture of the 57 and the 420, 121. Sorry. Let's take a second. Even in a pandemic, there's no excuse for out of tune guitars. That's just uh... cool. All right. So that's where you do your blend. Uh, mic distance is the next box, uh, and this is where you have some control over where the mic sits in, in, in relation to the guitar cabinet. So short typically is right up against the grill. Um, I'll back it off a little bit. Here's you know, it's a little less in your face, but really, really nice. And here's the furthest option, long. I'll go back to, I like medium, I'm going to go somewhere in the middle there. Um, and I'm just going to slide the editor again to the right so we can see exactly what's going on here. Come on, there we go. All right, so uh, mic position, this is pretty cool. So mic distance is measuring obviously how far away we are from the actual speaker cabinet. Mic position is how far away the microphone is from the center of the speaker cone. So on the center, you would expect to hear a ton of top end, or this will be the brightest setting. As opposed to, let's like move it seven centimeters away. That might be a little drastic, but. You can really hear the difference. I think I had it set for five, but usually I'm in around three or four somewhere. So you get really get great control over where you're placing the mic, just like you would on uh, a real cabinet. So you're just moving it around, finding the sweet spot on this particular cabinet with that particular microphone. Uh, the, the last box over here is pretty interesting. I believe the right way to say that is anechoic, which is an anechoic, it refers to an anechoic chamber. These things are really cool. They're like, um, there's, it's about as dead as you can make a room. So that, that when you walk into them, and once you spend like a few minutes in there, you sometimes get disoriented because your balance feels off. All of a sudden, ambient sounds around you are completely gone. So it's a very, it's a silent room. Um, they do a lot of mic testing and uh, amp testing and speaker testing and speaker designing in anechoic cha chambers. So that basically is a fancy way of saying there's no room sound, it's completely dry, um, which is typically what I like and what I use, and I'll explain why in a, in a little minute. But um, uh, And then we have some other options here. So uh, mid-room A, let's try that one. That, that, that's simulating... Um, you know, adding a little bit more of the room mic into the mix. 
Gee, if I turn my delay off, you might be able to hear that a little bit better. Here we go. And let's go to the super wide big room so you can hear a difference. It just feels so great and sounds great. I know I could noodle all day long. Anyway, so I go back, I go to the anechoic, which seems awfully boring when you have those other choices. The reason I like it is because um, this is going to typically maybe the front of house, uh, or it's going to my recording console, um, or it's going to a mixer, and typically that's going to be broadcast somewhere else. So if it's front of house, you're playing into a, a, a club, a bar, theater, stadium, wherever you're lucky enough to play these days. I like this to send as dry a signal as I can in terms of the room sound because you're playing it in another room. So that room itself will add um, the character to your sound. So uh, if I've already got like a large room sound on there, it might interfere with the space that I'm already in, and um, which dives into a topic about standing way, uh, uh, not standing ways, but um, early reflections and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, so yeah, I, I just leave it on anechoic, and I'll create any space with my delays and rhythms, uh, delays and, and reverbs, um, and leave the room sound to the actual room I'm playing in, unless I'm going for an, an actual effect, uh, which is a totally different story. But for the most part, I stay on an anechoic. And that's the heart of the editor right there. Um, now, up on the top area here, there's, there's, there's a few things. I'll start over on the right. This is where you'd make a, 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 oh, you can't see me on the screen yet, but on the right of the editor, you would save that portion. That's where you would write and save your rigs. You can write them, rename them, um, place them anywhere, anywhere you like, and all, all of the rigs are right there. Um, next to that is an indicator peak clear. So if you are hitting a red on any of your single signals, you can clear it right there. Rig MIDI is self-explanatory. This is where you send all of your rig information. Like, let's say you're passing on MIDI information to uh, you know, a, a, the OD200 that I have connected, or a DD200, or you, whatever delay you may have, um, or whatever MIDI uh, pedals you may have, or device, you can send your MIDI information there. And on the top here is amp control on and off. I can tell it to, you know, if I turn that off, it'll switch over to my clean channel. Uh, up on the top here, we have librarian, which if you're familiar with um, other Boss products, you will know that uh, there's a librarian in a lot of the editors, and it's a really cool spot for saving your own personal guitar rigs, you backing up your system, backing up your rigs, saving them to your computer. I, I, I always keep mine on a, on a thumb drive, and I, and I email them to myself. So if, you know, worst case scenario, if I have to reload uh, rigs, I can, uh, I can find them really quickly. Um, and then back on the top here is the system section, which I think is pretty awesome too. Um, Got control over your USB settings, MIDI settings. Uh, this is for, for the Pro Tools at the beginning there. I was sending MIDI commands from Pro Tools to change channels on the Waza Tube Amp Expander, and this is how you do it. You know, channel, I'm using channel two. You can make that whatever you want. And currently, I have all the con uh, controller, cha con control controller changes off. Um, and what are those exactly? Those are, so program changes are what changes the actual rigs, your program. So that will be your preset, and you've got 10 of those. So you'd send a, rig, a program change to change through those 10 rigs. Well, within those rigs, you have, let's say you want to turn your delay on off. Well, you'd need to do a CC command to do that. So, and this is where you would, this drop down box is where you do it. So here's the delay right here. So I can tell it, you know, I want that to be control. Control change or controller change, one. Um, so when I, when I've got my MIDI device in front of me, I just send CC CC command one. It'll turn my delay on and off. Um, pretty simple. So there's program changes and controller changes, and you define what you want those numbers to be. You know, all the way from um, 
1 to 128. Now I will mention uh, in Pro Tools, uh, different, different, different programs or different DAWs use slightly different MIDI um, configurations. And there might be a way to change it in Pro Tools, I'm not sure. Um, on the Waza 2 Bamp Expander, they go, uh, their program changes go from 1 to 128. Uh, Pro Tools goes from 0 to 127. So when you're doing a rig change, they're one behind. So if I'm trying to access rig 5, if I put in rig 5, it'll, Pro Tools will send me to rig 6. So um, if you want rig 5, do a, com a program change to rig 4 in Pro Tools and it pulls up rig 5. So that, that's just, they're going from 0 to 127. One to 128. It's just different for different devices, and I'm sure there's probably a way to remap that in Pro Tools, but I have no idea. Maybe somebody can write it into the to the chat. So here's the MIDI program map. Same thing. You can map out what all your program changes are and what rig you want to turn on and off. The global EQ that we spoke about earlier is is global on your speaker out and your line out. So. Um, I don't have anything going to my speaker, but line out, I'm just cutting maybe a little top end at 10K, maybe a little bottom at 80. Uh, that helps with you know, large PA systems and stuff, and it's kind of cool to have a global master. Uh, speaker out polarity, you can flip the phase on, or flip the polarity on your uh, speaker if you want. Uh, Fletcher Munson, I might leave that till the very end. Um, owner's manual, device setting, version, all backup, all pretty um, self-explanatory. Fletcher Munson curve. I have this turned off. It's probably worth noting that when you buy a Waza tube amp expander, this as a default comes on the on position. And what it is, I thought, hey, this Fletcher Munson, did he play for the Leafs? No, he did, did not play for the Leafs. It's actually two people go back into the 50s. And what they designed is, um, or what they figured out was, uh, and I, hopefully I don't get this wrong, is loudness curves, basically, um, that as vol a, a volume of a source, let's say we're listening to, you know, song on the radio, as the volume increases, the perception of that volume change, the, the, the frequencies change based on the volume and how we perceive the volume as the volume increases. So at lower volumes, the mid-range frequencies are more prominent and the lows and the highs are dipped down. As we turn up the volume, the low and the lows and the highs are accentuated, and the mid frequencies are dipped down a little bit. Um, so it's kind of interesting. That's how our ears treat uh, volume. Uh, the sound itself is not changed. Nothing's changed. It's just at lower volumes we perceive it differently than higher volumes, and that's what this Fletcher, uh, Fletcher Munson figured that out back in the 50s, and it's since been revised. I think in the 70s. It was updated a bit. So there's two different types of what they call loudness curves now. And it, I don't know if you remember those old home stereos we used to have. It'd have a loudness button right on the bottom, and that's what that was. It was activating a loudness uh, curve. So what does it do? What does all that mean? Basically what it means is that at lower volumes, like your lower, like these, these amps, my Marshall amp turned down low, they're very thin sounding. You lose all the bottom end. Um, so what a Fletcher Munson curve does, when you turn that on, it compensates for that loss of bottom end at lower volumes. So if you are playing in your condo like I do often, I turn that on and it adds all this really cool bottom end to fill out the sound that is not there when, it, when uh, I'm playing at such a low volume. Um, when I'm gigging, I leave that turned off. Uh, but it's just at, when, you're, when you're at low volumes. So one thing to note, if you are using an amp that's got a ton of bottom end, even at low volumes, you know, rectifier, diesel, something like that, um, the EVH series of amps, killer sounding amps, they have a ton of volume, ton of bottom end. Um, when you first connect it to the Waza tube amp expander, you might think, oh, that sounds really bassy. That, that, that's because the Fletcher Munson curve is on, especially at a lower volume. As you turn up, it becomes less of an effect, but at lower volumes, you'll definitely notice it. So if you are feeling that there's way too much bottom, um, then just turn the Fletcher Munson curve off. They won't mind. <laughs> I leave it off 90% of the time. So, um, so that's the editor. Now there's a couple things in closing here I just want to ad uh, address. One in particular, um, there's, uh, as you notice, I'm sitting, my amp is cranked. I'm sitting right next to the Waza tube amp expander with my, my pickups. If you get too close, 
it would just be like if I'm standing too close to my amp and I've got my overdrive turned on and I'm on my distortion channel. You'll start to get this, it's a feedback, an oscillation occurs, which is completely and 100% normal. It would happen if I'm standing in front of my amp with my overdrive on, volume wide open, and I'm not touching anything. It would be squealing like crazy against the, uh, the output transformer. So it's no different with the Waza tube amp expander because it, it is um, replicating your amp exactly. So whatever would happen to your amp would happen here too. So I was playing around with Matt earlier. Um, I can actually make that happen, which you know is not a desirable effect. But David Gilmore did make this a very desirable effect. So so there's my my distorted sound. Actually, I'll turn my delay back on here. Let's turn my delay on. There it is. So I'm going to turn my overdrive on and bring up the volume on the guitar and you're going to hear like a pretty distinctive oscillation and then I can control that with my, uh, with my tone knob on the guitar which is kind of cool. Yeah, ch check out a tune at called Echoes. It's on uh, Metal. It's a Pink Floyd album. Really awesome uh, album from the 70s, I believe. And a pretty cool album. A song called Echoes. There's a whole middle section of, I think there's two of them on left and right, double tracked, seagulls sounding, uh, seagull type of sound. And David Gilmore did that by reversing the input on his wah pedal, um, basically plugging it in backwards and manipulating his volume control. But I'm getting that right now, but you know, pretty cool effect. And so that's completely normal, and that, and usually you wouldn't be sitting this close, you know, to a really raging signal. Because even though in the room it doesn't sound that loud, but I'm sending an extreme signal to the tube amp expander. So, yeah, you get a little bit of oscillation if you're standing right next to the unit. But I learned something cool today, and that's I can replicate that sound without having to plug my uh, wah pedal in backwards. So I just go stand right next to the amp and hold my guitar up to it, and away we go. So I think that's pretty. I think it's really neat and really cool that it reacts exactly like your tube amp would, which I, I think is, is definitely the name of the game, for sure. Now there's one thing I want to, I, I won't get out of this slide, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave the editor up, but the last thing I want to show before I play something and do a little bit of, have a little fun here with Pro Tools, is what if disaster strikes, tube amps can, can be um, temperamental, tubes can be temperamental, disaster strikes and your amp goes down on a gig, then what? Um, you, most of us that use tube amps live will bring a backup solution of some kind, but the cool thing with the Waza tube amp expander is you don't necessarily have to. So I'm just going to pop my amp on standby. Um, if you've got a great sounding overdrive that you love, you can have that already patched into your uh, effects loop on the Waza tube amp expander on, uh, into the return. And you can patch that in and maybe you don't use it at all. Hopefully the whole night you, you might not even use it, but it's just there in case something goes down with your amp and it's a quick way of patching in. Now I'm patching a little differently here, so I'm just going, going to do a couple things. But what I'm going to simulate is the, so the amp's on standby. Let's pretend it has conked out. And I'm going to patch myself into the return of the Waza tube amp expander and use my trusty OD200 here to provide my, my uh, amp sound. So I'm just going to do that really quick. Let's see if I can do this gracefully live on Facebook across the country. I did it. All right. Now, now for me, Rig 10, I always leave Rig 10 as my my fail-safe rig, everything's you know gone wrong, and uh, if ever that happens with my amp, I switch over to Rig 10, automatically turns on the effects loop and patches in my overdrive. And so right now, the signal we're going to hear is not the amplifier; it's simply the OD200. And the OD200 does sound great, by the way. I'm using I think the uh, the DS1 setting on here, and it sounds to me sounds amazing. So. Uh, overdrive on the left channel, uh, left foot switch. The right foot switch here is just activating, you know, a, a, a boost that's on the OD200, and that can also be switched by the control jack on the back of the Waza tube amp 
uh, expander. So it would be a quick change live. You'd plug basically into, into the return of your loop to get the overdrive. I might unplug the cable really quickly from, um, I, I would plug my cable, yeah, I'd, I'd plug my control jack cable out of here into the amp control jack on the back, and now we've got channel controls switching between the two or four channels that are on the OD200. So it's a, it's a great solution if your amp has gone down. So what does it sound like? It sounds like this. So I think that sounds pretty fantastic for, you know, an overdrive pedal plugged directly into the 100 watt linear super clean power amp from the Wazate, and uh, it sounds incredible. Now, you know, crank up the volume on the front of that to match the um, to match the drummer, the situation you're in, and the show goes on. So you, you and it's a great solution. You still have the channel switching based on the pedal itself. I've also used the JB2. Boss, which is great for that as well, switching between you know two completely different channels. So, yeah, it might not be uh, the ideal situation, but you know the, you get through the rest of the night and it sounds fantastic. I mean, it surprised me how close that sounds to my amp. Um, pretty amazing. But um, anyway, so I'm going to make the switch back here. So if you can indulge me, Matt, I'm just going to unplug a couple things here. Plug this back into my return. Let me do this. Pretty graceful, it's like it never happened. And then let's get rid of this guitar here. I'm going to switch guitars and do a, have a little bit of fun here with Pro Tools. How's everyone doing out there in Facebook land? Hope you guys are doing well. And I hope you've uh, had gotten some information today and uh, may, probably a lot of you maybe haven't had a chance to uh, play with the tube amp expander at all uh, during the pandemic but um, they're, all, they're at Long McQuaid so I'm sure uh, you drop into a store anytime and any of the great staff there would walk you through it and uh, show you some of the finer features and points and they have a ton of great amps there so um, there's no shortage of tube amps uh, to choose from. So I'm going to Go to my first rig here. Where am I going to go? Let's go here. Let's drop out of the editor. Oh, <laughs> there's my twins. They made it onto a live stream. How cool is that? All right. Oh, yeah. And put, turn my hand back on. All right, so here we are in Pro Tools here. I'm going to call up a memory location. So one of the benefits of um, the Waza Tube Amp Expander is, you know, being able to record home, uh, record at home direct without making a lot of noise, especially in a condo. And also, the Tube Amp Expander is an interface, so you don't have to invest in a separate interface. USB straight in uh, within your computer. You assign. Uh, you just tell the inputs and outputs that you want to use the Waza Tube Amp Expander. And that's it. It's pretty straightforward. And um, so as you can see, I have a track armed in Pro Tools. It's blinking red there. I have a pretty healthy signal going in the front. And I'm going to do a little recording. So this, this track is only a minute long. I'm going to put down like a typical session. Maybe you're going to put down the left and right rhythm and then the solo at the end. And then we'll play it and uh, see how it sounds out there to you. So here, here we go. Um, here's a little home recording.
All right, cool. So typically in the real world, I might take a you know, second stab at that and get it a little bit better or punch into a couple different spots. We're not going to bother with that today. I'm going to just do a double track. So same thing. I'm going to try match the first track. Um, let's see how that goes. Here we go. Cool, let the delay trail off a little bit. So there's our two tracks, um, doubled fairly close. I know I was off there a little bit, couldn't remember exactly what I played the first time, but um, yeah, if this was uh, the real world, we'd probably go in there and fix that a little bit. So let's bounce in somewhere to this, just before the solo, I'm just gonna throw something down really quickly and uh, hopefully get one of those first take magic kind of things. Let's hope. and. Uh, then we'll take a listen. Here we go. Alright, cool. I know I made a bunch of mistakes there, but let's just take a listen to that back. I, I, I think I have uh, a decent mix going here, but I will... Uh, there we go, there's, there's the faders. Let's turn that off. Take a quick listen and see how that sounds. Here we go. Yeah, there's a few mistakes, but I think I can live with that. And uh, so that's pretty much most, if not all, of uh, the was a two-bit spinner. We didn't really touch on IRs that much. Um, I feel like that's a whole second or a whole separate uh, topic of its own. Um, there's 32 IR spots within the was a two-bit amp expander. Uh, so if, if you're not happy with any of the 23 cabinets that you have in there, um, yeah, feel free to load in, tw there's 32 uh, IRs, and IRs are pretty cool, I mean that's a snapshot of an entire rig, right? So it's like a cabinet, microphone, mic cable, preamp, is a snapshot of that entire rig and it's pretty static, um, but you might take a snapshot of my Marshall or a 70s Marshall with green, and then you move the mics around and stuff, and you can get some, it's a rabbit hole, I love that rabbit hole, as you could probably tell earlier, I've got all of the IR slots filled 
on my Waza tube amp expander because I, I just love the options. So yes, most of the time I'm using the 412 FOH cabinet that's built right into the tube amp expander. But yeah, sometimes on the session, maybe you want to use uh, you know a 70s green bag cabinet with uh, a microphone that I can't afford, like a, you know U47 or something. That was a big. That was uh, you know favorite of uh, Angus from ACDC. So it gives you an option of, of um, grabbing cabinets that aren't ready available. So that, that's kind of cool. That whole IR world is really really cool and. They interface perfectly within the Waza tube amp expander, and you do have 32 options there. So that's like 32 plus a 23 or 24 odd cabinets that are in there. That's a lot of cabinets. Can you imagine if you took those to a gig? That that'd be <laughs> that would be awesome. But um, but yeah. So that it's an amazing device. It's really um, been a dream for uh, a tube amp fan like me. I, I love it. Like it's basically solved almost what. Well, every single issue I have with two, two amps and interfacing them live and I can actually use my old live uh, use my old amps again which I hadn't even turned some of them on for years in the condo like there's just no way I could use them so now those old amps are back and uh, the pandemic was me a great chance to actually play them again and fall back in love with them so it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic uh, device so I, I definitely rec recommend if you get a chance pop into your local Long McQuaid any of the staff would be happy to show you one um, and they have an insane wide range of different amps that will all sound amazing with it. Um, so I'd like to thank you all very much for taking time out of your busy days and joining me here today. That's amazing that you did that. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Russell Gray with Boss. And I'd, I'd love to thank Matt here uh, for working so hard. And if it looks good out there, it's Matt. If it sounds good, it's Matt. Um, if it doesn't, it's all me. So the, Matt is making things look, look absolutely and sound absolutely amazing. And, and of course, I'd love to uh, thank Roland Canada and Boss Canada and all my colleagues that are probably out there on the other end of this uh, camera helping out. That's amazing. Thank you, guys and girls. Thank you very much for doing that. And uh, lastly, thank you, Long and McQuaid, for inviting us. We love doing this. And if there's any products that you want to see specifically in the future, um, yeah, drop a line in the comments and I'd be happy to talk uh, about any of the products, maybe the SY-1000 that's sitting right over there, or any of the OD-200s or DD-200s, any of the 200 series stuff. Yeah. Anything you want, if there's something you want to see or hear, definitely let l and know. know. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope we get to see each other in person soon one day at a show or in a store or somewhere, but uh, thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Take care. Long and with the music begins.